Good morning and welcome to worship this morning at First Presbyterian Church in Denison and Grand Avenue Presbyterian Church in Sherman, Texas. We're so glad to have you with us. Today we're finishing this worship series where we're doing it in different places. Next week we'll be back together and we'll welcome those of you who are willing to take the chance to be together if you're wearing a mask and willing to sit um, apart from one another to be together in the sanctuary at First Presbyterian Church in Denison. Following that service, we will have a congregational meeting to take care of some business for the year. And so we invite you to join us. We also will invite you to, uh, to join us online. I will send out uh, an invitation next week for a Zoom connection so that you'll be able to participate in the congregational meeting online that will follow the service. So next Sunday, we will be worshiping at 1030 at First Presbyterian in Denison, and we'll follow that with the congregational meeting. And today, since we're going to be hearing about fish and fishing, I'm going to put on a, one of my favorite stoles that has to do with fishing and nets and fishers. So let us join together as we worship God and as we do so in uh, our more relaxed atmosphere. I invite you to join me in a cup of coffee as we give thanks to God and as we join together in worship. Friends, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And now let us worship God. comes my salvation. For, For God, God alone, alone my soul waits in silence. God alone is my rock and my salvation. God is my fortress. I shall never be shaken.
our prayer of confession. Forgiving God, we repent of all the ways we turn from you. You call, but we do not listen. You show us your path, but we prefer our own way. Forgive us, heal us, and lead us back to you, that we might show mercy to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join me in saying, in his name we pray. Amen. is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives you all your sins strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. today is Jonah, the third chapter, verse 1 through 5 and verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nivea, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nivea according to the word of the Lord. Now Nivea was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nivea shall be overthrown. And the people of Nivea believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The Gospel reading for this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Hear now this word. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
hear this story about the prophet Jonah, we hear about someone who was told to do something that he did not want to do. It was the furthest thing from his wishes to go and give a word from God to the people of Nineveh. There are sometimes difficult things that we're called upon to do or to say. We don't want to do them. Maybe it is that we don't want to speak a certain word because we know <laughs> that's going to stir up trouble for us. It's going to stir up the people who disagree with us or disagree with that particular perspective. Or it's going to make a lot of extra work and effort that you'd really rather not have to do. Maybe what you'd rather do is to keep things tamped down, to keep things peaceful, to keep the water easy instead of roughed up. Sometimes it's like that. We don't want to do those things. We don't want to say those things. There will be people who don't want to hear what we have to say. There will be people who may challenge us and uh, come against us if we say the things that we're supposed to say. And yet, Sometimes those things that are supposed to be said turn out to be very important. We think about where we are with the pandemic. There were words that some didn't want to say because they were difficult words. Maybe they didn't want to face them. Maybe they didn't want to have the trouble that would come with them. Maybe they just didn't want to deliver news that sounded bad. And yet, if we had heard that word, it might be that we could have been better prepared for what was ahead, that we could have done different things or taken different actions. And we might have found ourselves in a little better place now. Who knows? Words that could have been spoken were not spoken. Maybe because it was easier not to speak them. Maybe because it was easier to have those that were not liked or those they might have disagreed with just not find out about those things. There's a time for those truthful words to be spoken that can help us get ready for tough times or tough things ahead. But the funny, funny thing about Jonah is he didn't want to speak those truthful words because he knew if he spoke them to the Ninevites, they would change and God's grace would be with them. And Jonah didn't want the Ninevites to be spared. Jonah instead wanted to have the Ninevites face all of the consequences that were before them, the judgment of God with no chance for any kind of change. Jonah wanted those enemies of his and of his people to be destroyed. And if he didn't speak those words, he knew that's what would happen. He was hoping that God's judgment, not God's grace, would have its way with the Ninevites. And so he wanted to withhold those words. That's when he went and got a ticket for the boat to go as far away as he possibly could. And as they sailed away from Nineveh, a storm came up. Bad things were happening. The waters were getting stirred. The sailors were nervous. They were scared. They were sure that 
This was some kind of judgment from some gods somewhere. They did everything they knew to do to make it stop. They threw all of their cargo over. That didn't settle things. The boat was still coming close to sinking. They finally began to grill their passenger who had come on board with them. And Jonah finally fessed up. Yes, it was, it was probably him. Jonah had decided that he would rather die by being thrown into the sea than to deliver the word of God to the Ninevites. He would rather give up life itself than for him to go and speak those words that would save the lives of the Ninevites. The sailors threw him overboard. He went into the sea. The waters began to calm. And surely, old Jonah was sinking fast to his death. And that's when a great fish came and swallowed him up. And that fish, of course, is one of those devices, something used by God to bring about what is supposed to happen. Instead of meeting his death, instead of perishing in the waters or in the belly of that great fish, that fish swam right to the shore of Nineveh and spit Jonah up in the very place he did not want to go. He still had it before him. He saw that he was supposed to do what God intended him to do. He still didn't want to do it. But he went into the city. The text says it was a city that was great. It was a three-day walk across the city. It may have been that the city that, that has been found and identified as likely to be Nineveh was large, but it, may, it might have taken three days to walk around the city. Jonah walked into the city a day's journey. And the implication is maybe that instead of going into the center of the city, maybe he only walked a third of the way. Or if that's the circumference of the city, walking three days around it, walking into it a day would put him in the center. Maybe he got to the center of the city, maybe he only got part way. But what he did was to deliver one of the most bare bones sermons that could ever be given. The text says that he cried out, but who knows if he didn't really want them to get the news, how much he actually cried out. He said, 40 days more and Nineveh will be destroyed. That's it the whole sermon, the whole thing, the whole kit and caboodle. Forty days more and Nineveh will be overthrown or destroyed or changed, depend on, depending on how the word is translated that's used there. And here's the interesting thing. When Jonah goes and delivers that word, spare as it is, the Ninevites hear it and they are changed. They go and put on sackcloth and ashes. They, they, they begin to take the actions of mourning or repenting, signs of what's going on inside them as they begin to change their actions, change the things that they're doing based on this word that's been spoken. And here is God and Jonah who've been going back and forth all through this text. And when Jonah finally delivers this sermon... He doesn't even mention the name of God. It's just 40 days more and Nineveh will be destroyed or changed or overthrown. Everyone in the city repents. They change. Even the cows change. <laughs> Everybody changes from top to bottom, even the livestock. And then someone else is changed. God sees that the Ninevites change. And God, the immutable, God, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the one who never changes, 
God changes. God changes what God had intended to do. God does not destroy the city. God seems to celebrate that the city has changed. You might think that Jonah would be happy about it, but he was not. He didn't even want to go and worship with them or give thanks for what had happened. Jonah still would rather die than to worship or to celebrate with these Ninevites that he did not like at all. But God keeps nudging him, showing him that maybe God's love is bigger than even what Jonah would like for it to be. God has Jonah do what Jonah didn't want to do for the good of the world, for the good of people that Jonah didn't like, didn't love, didn't agree with, didn't want to be a part of. The Ninevites were changed. God was changed. And maybe Jonah was changed too. When we take a look at the gospel reading for the morning, we see Jesus calling disciples to come and follow him. He's been going throughout Galilee. He's begun to pull people together to ask them, invite them, call them to come and be a part of what he's doing. He's down at the Sea of Galilee, or Lake Tiberias, where he sees two sets of brothers. He goes to Simon and Andrew and to James and John. He calls to them and says, come and follow me. Come and I will make you fish for people. Simon and Andrew give up their nets. But James and John give up their father, the hired hands, and the boat where the nets were. Maybe it means that some are called to give up more than others, or maybe others have more to give up than, than some of us. Jesus calls out to them, calls out to them to come and follow. My guess is that they had been subsistence fishermen getting by on what they could get each day from one day to the next and thinking that that's probably all that life had before them. Jesus called them to come and do what they didn't think they could do, to be fishers of people called to do what they didn't think they could do. Jonah called to do what he didn't want to do. When I think about where we are right now as a nation, I wonder what it means for us to think about being called to do things that we don't necessarily want to do. What if God is calling us to reach out to, to care for, and to love people in the other half of the nation that we'd rather not be bothered with? What if God is calling them to care for people that they'd rather not be bothered with? What if God is calling both sides in this divided nation to come and find a way to do what we didn't think we could do? Like Jonah, to deliver a word of grace to people that we'd be fine with not having grace. What if God is calling us to do things like 
love and care for people who thought of us as enemies or whom we thought of as people that we could never like. What if God's call to us is to love people, all of them, even when we thought we couldn't, even when we thought it's not the thing we would want to do. To be a follower of Jesus is to find out that God's grace is bigger than any one of us. God's grace is the thing that calls us all together to be a new people in a new creation, to go deliver a word of grace and love, of care, of compassion, even to those whom we thought of as enemies, whom we may now discover as friends, brothers and sisters, in the kingdom of God. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the Word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the Church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus.
Friends, let us join together in a word of prayer for those in our concerns. Let us pray. God, we come to you in thanks for your great compassion, for the ways in which you give us your grace, even in surprising ways, and sometimes direct us to be a part of it in ways that are surprising to us. We pray for the well-being of the world as people all across your creation face difficult times with this virus and with other tough things that are coming about. We pray that we may find new and more effective ways to be a part of reaching out to them, of caring for them, of preventing the hazards of this disease. We pray that we may come together as a people, as a nation that still feels terribly divided, that we might find a way of coming together in service to one another by caring for those who are sick, by looking at ways of preventing this disease, of finding within ourselves a sense of mission and purpose for taking on a challenge that is before all of us to be a part of healing the nation, bringing together the divides that are among us, finding common purpose in serving one another and serving the world. We pray too for our local community as we hear news of the virus being on the rise still. We pray that we may be cooperative and work hard to try to get medication to those who are in need and prevent the further spread of this disease. We pray that we may search ourselves for ways of being your faithful people, loving the world, loving our enemies, loving one another, as we come to know ourselves as a people of God. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Friends, now let us give to God the Lord's tithes and our offerings. up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Maker, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and in every moment of your living. The Lord be with us. The Lord be with us all.